Thank everyone who took the pretest. Um, after today's session, you will receive a second survey link as the post test. Um, and evaluation tools are very important um, for the continued success of projects like this. So if you can just take a few minutes to do that, we really appreciate it. Also, um, this session will be recorded and will be able to be found on a, as a link on emeraldashboard.info. Um, so if you want to view it again or if there was somebody that you knew that wasn't able to participate, um, they can have that opportunity. I am just one of the, whoops, Sorry about that. I'm just one of the three EAB Three Amigos, which also includes Jody Ellis with Purdue University and Robin Usborne with Michigan State University. EABU is sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service, and we want to thank them for their interest in our web-based training idea and support to make this educational opportunity free to all participants. In Ohio, I've had the opportunity to be the Outreach and Education Coordinator for Extension on Emerald Ashbor for the last several years. Um, and in addition to my scarlet and gray, I also have emerged as, Emerald, as Amy the Emerald Ashbor at several events across the state. A giant bug can capture a lot of attention and has been an excellent outreach tool in our state. Today's session is Emerald Ash Bore 101. We're going to talk a little bit about ash trees and what happens when Emerald Ash Bore arrives on the scene. Yeah? Hmm. Okay. All right, well, just one second here. Uh, Robin was telling me the screen looks a little pixelated, so I'm going to try to do this from the desktop. So hold on one second. to everybody's comments it said they say it looks good on their screen so we're just gonna go with that um, my volume okay Robin all right so as you can see it can be a lethal combination millions of ash trees have already been killed by this exotic invader and this number will continue to grow as the insect spreads the impact of emerald ash borer is far-reaching if it's an ash it's at risk the photos in this slide include street trees, landscape trees, trees in woodlots, and park trees. All are dead due to the emerald ash borer. This PowerPoint presentation is going to cover the insect, including its life cycle and biology, information on host plants, a brief history lesson about how it came or where it came from and how it arrived in the United States, signs and symptoms to look for, some impact, and highlights and other considerations for those managing ash trees. I will also have a remaining schedule for EAB University at the end of the PowerPoint that you can always see if you go online at emeraldashbor.info. Let's start with the insect. If you're interested in printed information, USDA APHIS has a tri brochure as well as several states have developed similar fact sheets that can be accessed through emeralddashboard.info as this is the king of websites that links to all other states. 
When we talk about the insect, emerald ash borer is a beetle belonging to a family known as the metallic wood borers. Adults of many species in this family are brightly colored with a metallic glint, making them favorites for collectors. The beetles appear as though they were painted with metal flaked paint. Emerald ash borer belongs to the same genus, which is Agrilus, as the bronze birch borer and the two-line chestnut borer, which are both native to North America. The biology of the emerald ash borer is quite similar to these native relatives. Typically there is one generation per year, although development can take two years in newly infested sites where the trees are still very healthy. Adult beetles are small and measure between a fourth and a half an inch in length. Some people have said that they're about the size of a tic-tac, which I think is a good visual. After emerging from an infested tree, adults feed on the foliage for one to two weeks prior to mating and producing a characteristic leaf notching that you can see. However, the feeding damage causes little harm to the health of the overall tree. A mated female can produce between 50 and 100 eggs which are laid individually on the bark surface or within bark cracks and crevices. Observations indicate that higher branches and upper portions of the tree are colonized initially, making it very difficult to detect early infestations. When the adult beetles emerge from the ash trees, they make a distinct D-shaped exit hole. If you look at the hole on the ash tree and have to imagine that it may be shaped like a D, it probably isn't. There are native bores that make round and oval shaped holes. The D-shaped exit holes can be found in any direction and in high infestation there can be several in a relatively small area of bark. You will typically notice the exit holes higher in the canopy in the beginning stages of the infestation once you see the exit holes at eye level, you can be pretty certain that the insect has been there for several years. Brupested larvae are commonly called flat-headed borers because of the flattened segment just behind the head and their wood boring behavior. The flattened cream-colored larvae have distinct bell-shaped segments making them look like miniature tapeworms. As they feed, they make serpentine frass-filled galleries just under the bark. If you're looking at an ash tree that has frass or sawdust looking material coming out of the holes or around the base of the tree, it's not emerald ash borer and most likely one of our native borers, maybe the clearwing borer. Emerald ash borer pack their frass right in the gallery that was created while they were feeding. All of the major damage to the ash tree is done by the insect while in this stage. The exact date of first and peak emergence will differ from year to year and location to location. This is very true especially with our wide audience that's listening today. But because of that, I wanted to highlight kind of the growing degree day information. Research estimate, researchers estimate that the first emergent begins approximately at 550 growing degree days and are continuing to work on growing degree models for peak emergence and end emergence. The first bloom can also be tied very closely to black locust if you happen to have that tree growing in your state or in your area. While normally the insect completes its life cycle within one calendar year, there are situations where the insect may take up to two years to complete its life cycle. The two-year life cycle occurs again in newly infested areas where trees are relatively healthy. In Ohio, adults begin to emerge in May and will continue through most of the summer. Once they have emerged, again they feed on ash leaves making notches in the leaf margins, will mate, and the female will begin laying eggs individually on the bark of ash trees. The egg hatches and the larvae immediately eats through the bark into the phloem tissue and the damage begins. In the fall, the mature larvae fold themselves over in a prepupal position, 
Some people call this J hooking as they resemble the letter J when they do this. It stays this way throughout the winter until the following spring when, pre when the insect pupates. The adults emerge and the cycle begins again. For those larvae that aren't ready to pupate the next spring, they will remain under the bark this winter and will feed next spring and summer when the temperatures warm back up. Those larvae will continue to feed and the following fall will they will be in their prepupal stage as I described earlier taking two years to complete the life cycle. Let's talk about the host plants. The good news is that emerald ash borer only attacks ash trees, those in the Fraxinus species. The bad news is that all North American ash trees are at risk. Ash trees are common through the United States in our rural and urban landscapes. They are an important component of the forest and estimates begin that there are billions and billions of ash trees growing naturally through our forest. Additionally, ash trees were one of the most frequently planted shade trees that were found in our yards, parks, golf courses, cemeteries, and along streets in communities across the United States. Ash trees were a common replacement for the American elms that were lost to Dutch elm disease. Ash trees have compound leaves that are arranged oppositely on branches. In the photo in the bottom right hand side is an entire leaf made up of nine leaflets. The typical range of leaflets is usually between 5 and 11. The seeds of the ash trees are pictured in the top right hand corner. The Samaras can remain viable in the soil for several years. There is a project underway to collect seeds from ash trees across North America. To learn more about the National Ash Seed Collection Project, you can check out their website at, um, with a link from emeraldashboard.info. This is a project that you might be interested in or would like to promote to others. There are brochures on their website that can be copied and distributed. They also have posters and a great PowerPoint presentation that people could use as a teaching tool in their own area. Each of the maps indicated here are the native range of white, green, blue, and black ash. Beyond the native range, ash has been planted outside of these areas because it's very adaptable and can tolerate a wide variety of conditions. If we look inside the tree, this simplified graphic shows the general structure or layout for a deciduous hardwood tree. Ash, birch, oak, maple, bark or the outside brown ring protects the tree. The phloem transport carbohydrates and sugars that are produced in the leaves through photosynthesis down the tree throughout the year. The phloem is a very thin layer and it is sappy or sticky. Remember that food flows through the phloem. Next is the cambium layer. This layer is only three cell thick cells thick. The cambium can become differentiated into phloem cells to the outside or new xylem cells to the inside. The cambial layer is very slimy. And finally, the next layer is the xylem. The xylem is what we know as wood of the tree. It's used for transporting water and nutrients up the tree from the roots and it provides the structural support of the, for the tree. I show this graphic that Joe Boggs at OSU created because emerald ash borers are primarily phloem feeders. They may etch into the xylem, but they're very active just underneath the bark. It's important to know if you're exploring wood utilization opportunities, there's a lot of uninjured wood in an infested tree. I guess this could be considered a bright spot in the world of emerald ash borer. Let's talk a little bit about emerald ash borer larvae feeding behavior. The tapeworm-like emerald ash borer larvae feed beneath the bark of a living ash tree. The larvae are primarily phloem feeders, as I described in the graphic before. As they feed, they consume the phloem, will consume the cambium, and just etch into the xylem, killing the host tree. Remember, this is the most devastating stage of emerald ash borer. They're very soft body, and they're a favorite food of woodpeckers who do a tremendous job of searching them out from underneath the bark. 
We'll talk a little bit more about this when we discuss signs and symptoms. You probably didn't think when you woke up this morning that you would get a history lesson, but we're going to talk a little bit about history. While the history in North America does not date back this far, Emerald Ash Borer has provided some to be creative and have a little fun. This was made by a Master Gardener volunteer in Ohio as a gift to their local extension educator. We have to find a little humor somewhere along the way. People always ask, where did it come from and how did it get here? While no one knows for sure, I'm going to share what probably occurred and many can agree on. Emerald ash borer was unknown in North America until June of 2002 when the announcement was made in Michigan that they found an insect. When it was discovered killing ash trees in southeastern Michigan and neighboring Windsor, Ontario. It's native to northeastern China, Mongolia, Taiwan, Japan and Korea where it occurs on several species of their native ash trees. It was probably imported into Michigan via infested ash crating or pallets at least 15 years ago based on some studies that Michigan State University has been involved with. About the same time Asian longhorn beetle became established in the United States but it was discovered more quickly. Since this time, additional regulations have been imposed on the treatment of pallets and wood packing materials coming from other countries. The map here shows you part of the PowerPoint highlights the native range of the emerald ash borer. Asian ash trees have genetic resistance to emerald ash borer as trees and insects have evolved over time together. This is very different from our North American ash trees where the host plants are genetically different and do not have this resistance. University researchers are working with the Forest Service on some ongoing genetic studies as well as host preference studies. Researchers hope to identify the differences in our Native American ash trees compared to the Asian ash and one day begin a breeding program like those for chestnuts and elms. Let's take a look at the most updated USDA APHIS map. Currently there are 13 states with known infestations that are immediately facing the impact of emerald ash borer. The states include Midwest states as well as some in the eastern part of the country. The level of infestation varies greatly from state to state and the red dots indicate positive finds. The population of emerald ash borer will continue to spread and more and more states will face the devastation caused by this green menace. The map is updated on a monthly basis and can be found on, you guessed it, emeraldashboer.info. Each state Department of Agriculture usually has a state quarantine denoted in white and yellows on this map. There is also a federal quarantine outlined in blue. As you can see, the states are quarantined along state boundaries. So although southeastern Michigan, northwest Ohio, and northeast Indiana are all generally infested, it's still illegal to move regulated materials across state lines. There will be an upcoming webinar specifically on the regulatory side of Emerald Ash Borer and will cover compliance agreements and issues related to the quarantine. thought everybody needs a little humor. This appeared in Columbus, Ohio um, and here Emerald Ash Borer are talking amongst themselves and they're moving out of Michigan and going to Disney World the, where the other one says we're off to Ohio where ash trees are plentiful and the population is apathetic and the eradication program is underfunded. When we talk about the spread of emerald ash borer, a lot of people relate it to the, a forest fire. So you have a point of introduction or the start of that forest fire, which in this case is the Detroit area where the original infestation occurred and other points of introduction through artificial movement are sometimes referred to as sparks or hot spots. 
The infested zone gets larger and larger and this happens rather quickly. Out of head of the infested zone is this transition zone where the hot spots are, where some of these surrounding states that may have few infestations. These smaller infestations tend to grow really slowly, uh, but they build in numbers and in some cases the main front, that big fire infested zone, will spread and take over in that transition zone. And soon the ash trees will all die in that area that aren't being protected. Those outlier spots or hot spots are developed by accidental movement of people from infested material like logs, ash trees, firewood, Early on, there was a lot of movement before anybody knew emerald ash borer was here in North America. For example, a resident in the Detroit area had a dead ash tree. They cut it down, stacked it up for firewood, and decided to go camping the next spring and just loaded some firewood along with them, taking the firewood and emerald ash borer along on the trip. If you have an infested tree and you cut it down today, adult beetles could still emerge the following spring. As described earlier, the larvae are done feeding for the season and can live in that firewood, pupate, and emerge as adults, even on cut firewood. Adult beetles will not lay eggs in firewood simply because their larvae need a living tree to develop. Quarantines and industrial industry responses have virtually eliminated the spread through infested trees and logs. However, infested firewood really remains an ongoing concern and it's a, something that we need to get the word out and continue to spread the message about not moving firewood. APHIS actually has a campaign that they started a couple years ago called the Promise Campaign. The campaign urges people to make a promise not to move firewood. The website counts the number of people making the promise by the state they reside in. Since we have people from all over the United States, you can go to this website, make your state proud by having a little competition and making your promise, and we can keep you posted on which state has the most promises. Again, firewood is probably the key message that we need to communicate, both infested states and uninfested states. Um, as you travel around, you'll see signs help protect our forest. All firewood is subject to inspection. Ohio has um, some signs made about not moving firewood and referring people to the hotline. Um, and it, during Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week, um, the yard signs, again, all talked about the message of not moving firewood. Let's talk about signs and symptoms and also how you can be trained as an emerald ash borer watcher. When we look at the trees, there's a pattern of decline in death, as you can see in this scale, that many of the researchers are using across um, infested areas. You can note, though, that all of those trees are infested with emerald ash borer. One is really showing no decline, would be in the very early stages, all the way through five when the trees are killed by emerald ash borer. It's important to note that if nothing is done, there is 100% mortality in the plots where the research has occurred um, in infested communities across the United States. The first pattern of decline is kind of an overall thinning of the tree's canopy. The picture on the left shows the thinning canopy. Additionally, you will see a thicker, more dense canopy near the main trunk. These are epicormic branches and they're the tree's way of trying to push new leaves and attempt to survive. Once in the portion the top portion of the tree dies, the roots, which are not directly killed by the emerald ash borer, will begin to shoot up stump sprouts and are shown on the right. This also happens when ash trees are removed and the stumps are not treated or ground up with a stump grinder. The growth shot up from the roots will be future food for the emerald ash borer once they become large enough. The overall decline 
to death of the tree typically occurs within three to five years. When we, we look for emerald ash borer, a declining tree canopy and heavy woodpecker activity will probably be the first symptoms that you see. Although both can be the results of other problems, observers must take a closer look. The first find in Ohio came from a resident who was concerned about the ash trees that were losing their bark. The bark was falling off in pieces as the woodpeckers were going after the emerald ash borer larvae underneath the bark. When looking at the infested trees, it almost appeared as though they had mulched um, regard, er, with the bark that had fallen off the trees. At that point, it was easy to go in and just pull back the bark um, and look for the galleries and the emerald ash borer. If it is emerald ash borer, further investigating will find the larvae underneath the bark. Um, you may also look for D-shaped exit holes that were left behind as the adults emerged from the tree. The exit holes are normally found first in the canopy of the tree, and as the population grows and there are more of them, the exit holes to be, appear to be lower on the main trunk and ultimately at eye level. We've also seen exit holes all the way down into the root flares. Frass-filled galleries can also be found underneath the bark. If it's a newer infestation, the, mar the bark can be difficult to peel and a draw knife, a hammer, and a chisel are some great tools that can make destructive sampling just a little bit easier. In heavily infested trees, the bark will come off in large pieces, exposing galleries that were formed in every available area of flowing tissue. The frass that was described in the galleries looks like sawdust that's just packed right in the gallery. When we talk about management options, if EAB were just a little bit larger, maybe we could make it a sport, but unf unf unfortunately that's just not the case. When it comes to management, we first have to know where emerald ash borer is. Early on, ash trees were detection tools by choice. Trees were girdled prior to the adult emergence and left standing during the flight season. In the fall and winter, the trees were dropped and the bark was peeled looking for larvae. This method was very time intensive and additionally, the detection trees could only be used once. Researchers were exploring other options. In 2002, the, or excuse me, in 2008, the purple traps were unveiled. The traps were baited with manuka oil and hung in trees. In 2009, phoebe oil was added to the manuka oil bait to increase the scent to draw in emerald ash borer. The three-sided traps were covered with tanglefoot on the outside panels. If EAB was in the area, the insects would be drawn to the scent of the manuka and phoebe oil and to the color purple. At a recent research update in Pittsburgh, scientists reported on the latest information regarding the traps. In 2010, USD APHIS will also be adding an additional color of traps um, to the program to be further tested in the field. The new color is a shade of green. The purple traps are a detection tool, but also an attention getter. When traps were placed in the spring of 2009, calls to the national hotline doubled. This is a good thing, raising awareness. For every situation, there's a different or unique management plan for that particular site, community, landscape, or park. The universities don't have a best plan that we're promoting, but rather providing information so homeowners, communities, woodland owners, and green industry businesses can make an educated decision on what works for them best. Plans can be developed for homeowners with a single tree, woodland owners that may have a few trees to a thousand trees, communities such as cities, townships, and villages that are managing trees in the right of way businesses, and metro parks, just to name a few. Anyone that owns, manages, or maintains ash trees should have a plan. The plan should be logical, be specific to their situation, 
and realize that there isn't a best plan for everyone. Plans should be made sooner than later. Many communities in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana didn't have time to prepare and had to deal with a lot of dead trees. This quote that's going to appear on your screen is just so true. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. We need to provide those facts based on research that's being done and our clientele to make educated and informed decisions on how they're going to manage their ash resources. Some people's opinion may be remo to remove every single ash tree prior to the arrival of the insect. Some will wait until the insect arrives and remove the trees on an as-needed basis. Others will remove some and treat others, and still, still others may treat all their trees. A number of ash trees and yearly budgets are two key factors when developing your plan. There tends to be a natural division of audiences when we look at streets, streetscapes and landscapes, which are often more urban, and our wood excuse me, our woodlands, which are more rural. But unfortunately, if nothing is done, the answer is the same. Whatever the location, there's something that we call synchronized death. While early on you may have a dead tree here or there, but very quickly they will all become infested and die rapidly. A couple summers ago, we had a tour in Northwest Ohio to kind of bring people in to show them the destruction and devastation that Emerald Ash Borer can accomplish. We compared two sites um, of street trees, one that still had ash standing and providing some shade to the community, and a second street where the trees were removed proactively to try to manage that population. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, there was already an a, a 20 degree difference in temperature from the street that still had some shade compared to the one where the trees were removed. We're also hearing a lot about parasitoid releases and biological controls. And again, there'll be a complete um, session on management, which includes the insecticides and controls but just want to touch upon it today in Emerald Ash Borer 101. Leah Bauer with the Forest Service has been leading efforts on the parasitoids. After much research in the lab, the first releases occurred in Michigan in August of 2007, and in 2008 additional releases were made in Ohio and Indiana. The parasitoids are very small and don't sting or bite humans. Um, they are not commercially available, and are not going to be the silver bullet that wipe out EAB populations, but rather a tool in the management toolbox. More information is to come as the research continues. Furthermore, researchers are finding some native insects that are also attacking emerald ash borer, including a ground wasp that searches for agrilus beetles, including emerald ash borer. Again, Probably not the silver bullet to eradicate emerald ash borer, but each can help in the management of EAB. More on this during the research updates. We also want to talk briefly about woodpecker um, activity. They are very drawn to the larvae of the emerald ash borer um, underneath the bark of the tree. They can be used to diagnose trees that are infested and kind of be early symptoms or early signs of an infestation. Um, but mortality can be highly variable. And in a large tree, there can be thousands of emerald ash borer larvae, and they can't get to all of them. So although a good tool, again, not the silver bullet that will control emerald ash borer. Next, we're going to talk about insecticide options. Just briefly, the most common question received in extension offices usually relates to insecticide treatments. 
There are many chemicals that are labeled for Emerald Ash Borer and the research continues. If homeowners are interested in treating their own trees, imidacloprid is the active ingredient that they'll probably be looking for. Uh, Bear Advanced Tree and Shrub Insect Control was a product of choice for several years. Recently their patent expired and other chemical companies have their own formulations that research needs to be done on. There are some additional options for those professionally treating trees including soil injections, trunk injections, and bark and canopy sprays. Whether people hire this service or do it themselves, beginning treatments when known infestations are within 10 to 15 miles are recommended. If you see canopy dieback exceeding 50 percent of the tree, success usually is very difficult. There is a multi-state bulletin authored by Herms, McCall, Smitley, Sadoff, Wil Wilmanson, and Nixon and is available as a PDF on the website or can be purchased through some of the state bulletin systems. Again, we're learning more and more about insecticides each year. Wood utilization may be something to consider and have in the back of your mind as you talk and develop your plan on how you're going to deal with emerald ash borer. Because of where the feeding occurs, in the, the heartwood of the tree remains undamaged and can be utilized. When exploring options for utilization, always remember the quarantines that are in place and be sure that regulations are, fo are followed to avoid spreading the insect pest even faster. This dining room set and wine rack were made from ash trees once standing on this person's property. Additional uses of ash wood include flooring, baseball bats, bowls, and other artistic pieces. The Southeast Michigan RC&D Council is addressing the emerald ash borer infestation in Southeast Michigan in a positive way by implementing ash utilization projects through demonstrations, training sessions, and a research program. They will actually be doing a session on EABU, specifically on utilization opportunities that exist. And so if that interests you, be sure that you sign up for that session. Here is a list of the different sessions that are scheduled for the remainder of this year's Emerald Ash Borer University. Our next session will be pesticides and biological controls to manage emerald ash borer. In January we have two research updates. Uh, we'll be doing the utilization on February the 4th, a session on woodland management, regulatory issues, helping commun communities cope with emerald ash borer, what happens after ash are gone, and of course emerald ash borer awareness week and ways to promote that in your own communities. Just like you did today, you can register for one or all of the classes through emeraldashboard.info. I appreciate all of the um, help that Robin and Jody have given um, to the questions that were being posed uh, while I was speaking. Are there other questions um, that we can address now through the chat or um, again this message will be or this session will be on emeraldashbor.info that you can review um, or have other people watch. Um, let me just pull up my computer screen here so I can see the chat questions that are occurring. Okay. Jody, were there other questions that we should address with everyone? I'm trying to go back and you guys did a great job communicating back and forth here. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening in to Emerald Ash Borer University EAB 101. 
Um, there will be a survey that post test that you can compare your knowledge gained through this session and have a great day.